Um, some things that have been in here for a little while we'll just touch real quick. Um, we are in this crazy world doing our best to try to keep our kids safe. So we just want to encourage parents to always have an eye on your kids um, for their own safety. Um, just to be careful and everybody else keep an eye on them too just to make sure. Um, we're also collecting personal care items for Project Connect that's coming up in October at the fairgrounds. There's a bunch of different community agencies that get together to help those in need with different items. And we are in charge of personal care. So we're collecting shampoos and conditioners, toothpaste, toothbrushes, deodorants, um, soaps, uh, feminine care, um, all that stuff we're collecting. So if you see a good deal, pick up an extra one or two and there's a basket out in the foyer, you can drop that in. Wednesday prayer meeting, seven o'clock. Please join us on before Wednesday. On Tuesday is the food distribution. Liz always needs help for that. So uh, if you're able to help, let her know or just show up here by at least three o'clock is helpful um, for loading some of that stuff. Pathfinders have a tubing outing coming up on next this coming Friday. So if you are part of Pathfinders, uh, pray for good weather and bring your sunscreen. So um, the 13th, there is a fellowship luncheon after the service. So bring a dish to pass and join us. If we can fellowship together. Next Thursday, August 18th, there is a church board meeting at 7. So if there are any items that you think need to be put on the agenda, let Pastor know ahead of time. It's just helpful for planning and making things go smoothly. Sabbath, August 20th, there is communion here at the church. So just something to plan for, uh, to prepare your hearts for and be ready for that um, special day. On the 21st, we are going to have our very first Pathfinder and Adventure meeting here at the church, 930. If you are planning to join, that is a time to come. We will be signing papers and that kind of stuff. But if you know of somebody who might be interested, but they're not sure, this is kind of an informal, informational meeting also. We will be doing activities for the kids, um, but just something so if you want to invite somebody to come, this is a, a good meeting to come to just to see if it's something they're interested in. So that's the 21st. We have been praying in Pathfinders for at least six children, so we're gonna need a few more. So think of who you can invite to come to that. The 27th um, is Linda Dickerson's 29th birthday. So, yes. So if you, are, if you are able to, after the church service at their trailer park, they're gonna have a tent set up bring a potluck food it'll just kind of be a potluck thing just to socialize and and celebrate with her but she is would like to invite everybody to come down for that if they're able to on the 27th um, in the insert you'll see there's several different addresses in there if you want to don't have them written down yet and you'd like to send cards or letters or um, something there's andrew um, is down in south carolina right now debbie tester just went out to washington and then Stella Powell and her boys are in Kentucky. And they've been there for a while, but I don't know if we ever had their address before. So we have that now if you're interested in, in sending it, that out to anybody. All right. Is there anything that I missed? All right. We'll prepare for our service.
Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day you've given us. The blessings of this past week and things as little as just thanks for waking me up this morning. Lord, we have we are privileged here in this nation and in this place at this time to be able to still freely come and visit and worship you. Now we ask, Lord, that you surround us this morning. Fill every empty chair here with another angel. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the victory. Let's stand and sing all verses of number 608. Faith is the victory. <laughs> At this time, uh, we have our offering, and uh, we'll have our deacons come forward and as they collect our offering plates. But our offering today is designated for our church budget. And church budget is very important. It helps us with our, our uh, functionality of our church. It helps us with our, our lights. It helps us with our air conditioning and our heat. It helps us with our Sabbath school lessons with the we that we buy, and uh, so many other things. So it's very important that uh, we give our, our portion to uh, our, our church for our, our church budget to help it to keep going. And uh, we, we appreciate the people that are giving online and those that are giving here on church. Uh, church budget is over and above our tithe. Of course, our tithe is 10%, which is you know a no-brainer question there. Uh, but uh, we, we'd like to... Uh, have our, our congregation and our members uh, know that they are very much appreciated by giving to the church budget. So this time, I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward to collect the tithes and offerings.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for so many blessings you've given us. And we thank you for the blessing of this church here in Centerville. We ask you please help us to make a light for you in the St. Joe County area. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to uh, keep this church going and, and functioning as a, a proper worship for you. And again, we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we have our praise and prayer time. And I have a few prayer and praise here that I'm going to read. And uh, we're going to start out with the Roberts family. I have a prayer request of Alexandra Prewitt, six-year-old, uh, Jerrica Tucker, um, 11 years old. They got kidnapped from Centerville Thursday, but I think they found them. Okay, I think they. I think I saw a note that their mother actually took them to Kalamazoo, but I think they they have found those. So, um, it's a, we have so many children. Kids have it rough in this world. The rough's not even a a, a a good statement. They have it hard, and uh, we need to pray for all our children, and uh, whatever we can do to mentor and to help. And um, the, the devils are asking. LaVon Hiles, I see that left. Uh, prayer for Larry, he has stage four kidney disease. It says uh, he only has one kidney and is functioning at 25%. Um, the doctors are trying to keep him stabilized. So let's think of, of Larry Hiles. Also we have a, a prayer list, uh, Heiser family. Where's Chris at? Um, they have uh, some cousins, Amber and Riley, and if you can imagine this, they lost four of the children in the, in the flood. Can't imagine. And pray for uh, also a cousin, Johnny Wayne, who is 60 years old. He also drowned in the flood. You know? So keep Chris and Tony and all their family members in, their, in our prayers. Our niece, Bonnie, um, my wife's sister, Shirley's daughter, Bonnie, has a mass on her lung and is going through some tests. Please pray for comfort and healing for, for Bonnie. Uh, Tiffany Nelson, uh, Tiffany Nelson Engel, uh, had surgery this last week and uh, they got some, some of the nasty cancer out of there, but uh, she is still needs our prayers and uh, she's just a precious girl and, and uh, think of Tiffany Nelson. Um, Vanessa, who is a uh, student at Andrews, has been hospitalized for the last six months because of kidney failure due to lupus. Uh, please pray for Vanessa. Uh, neighbor, Randy Richardson, he is recovering from getting his foot caught in a grain auger. And, uh, and it can't be fun, but he is home and um, I've seen him smile. So uh, please pray for Randy Richardson. Also, a cousin of ours, Jillian, 17-year-old, and her boyfriend were in a car accident and uh, going through some, some challenges and healing, and they need prayers specifically. Uh, we think of Jackie Gibson, and keep playing for her health and uh, improving. Also, Charmaine Hayden, my wife's uh, prayer partner, and I can continue to pray for her and her husband and her children and her grandchildren. Also, we have talked to uh, Stella Powell this last week. Um, my wife tried to call her a couple times. She's in Kentucky. And, uh, of course, with the floods, we, you know, we don't contact her. We're kind of nervous what's going on. But uh, she called us and, and said she's about 150 miles north of the main flooding area. So think of Stella. Our former members, Linda and Leonard DeYoung, and pray especially for Leonard's health. Our niece, Tammy, who lives in Alabama, uh, pray for her that she will get a kidney transplant. And, uh, of course, pray, pray for our missing church members. Is there any prayer re requests that I've missed? Okay. Is there any, um, Jackie? Mm-hmm. And uh, he's been on 
pray for him. Okay, thank you, Jackie. We pray for, for Jackie's friend. Um, is there any praise notes? No baby yet, huh? Soon? <laughs> You're trying your best, aren't you? I wanted to. Yes. She could be coming any time. Yeah. Joanna, right? <laughs> Johanna. Okay. <laughs> Good. We look forward to her. She's going to be our, our church baby. <laughs> Jackie had another. Yes. She has a grandbaby that should be here this weekend. Another grandbaby. Super. And is there any uh, silent requests we have? Okay. So this time, we could kneel for our, our morning prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you now. We've had some requests, and we had some silent requests, and we had some praise notes. And we thank you that uh, you are a God that can listen to us, take these prayer requests, and answer them according to your will. We have uh, talked about family members that are, are sick and hurting. We even talked to family members that have passed away. So sad, dear Father, especially when they're children. We ask you please be with the, the women that are close to having babies and, and the, the miracle that it always is. And help us to appreciate it and know that it is a miracle from you, dear Father. And our young people, our children, are the most important, precious resource we have in this world. Help us to know that... Uh, we need to take every measure to protect them, to grow in the right way, dear Father, and help us to do that. We know that the devil is a rascal. We have uh, talked about and had requests of, of these youngsters that were in a, a car accident and, and unfortunately are in need of medical help. We pray that doctors and others can work on them and, and uh, the Holy Spirit can guide and direct their hands to do things that are correct. We have raised our hands in silent request to your Father, your praise for prayers for ourselves or others in our family and our friends and neighbors. We thank you we can lay these burdens on your lap and you promise you take care of them. Please guide and direct us as we go from here. Give us a wisdom to make right decisions and good decisions. Help people to see you through us. Help us have a chance to talk to others about the love of Jesus. I ask you also to be my brother Rob as he brings a special word to our friends and loved ones. We thank you for being us, being with us, being patient with us, being our brother, being our salvation. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. At this, is there any personal ministries moment? No personal ministries? Okay, at this time, we have a story by Aunt Kathy.
So this is the story of the missing wallet. Um, Grandpa was looking for his wallet and he couldn't find it. It happened to be that we had grandchildren at our house and they like to play with things, especially grandpa things or grandma things they find interesting. And um, grandpa was very upset. He was looking for his wallet and he, anybody seen my wallet? Nobody saw his wallet, but we looked for it. Um, we looked everywhere, grandpa looked for it. And the one grandson, he, he, sometimes he likes to take things home or if he finds something special, he likes to hide it so that he can only have it. And so it was pretty likely that he might have favored that wallet. And so we thought for sure he might know where that wallet was. So we started interrogating him. Do you know where that grandpa's walk? No, he didn't know. Then he said something about being in the van, and we thought, oh, maybe he put it in the van so when he went home, he'd have a, a wallet. <laughs> so we tore that van up, mom and the brothers. We looked for the wallet. Grandpa looked for the wallet. Grandpa was getting real upset about the wallet being missing. And you know why, because you can't drive without your driver's license. You need your cards to pay for your gas. So I just kept saying, it'll be fine. We'll find the wallet. So mommy has to go home with the children, and we still don't have the wallet. But mommy says she's going to search everything when she gets home and call us. We're still looking for the wallet, and that's a four-hour drive. And, and she's searched everywhere, and she calls, and she says, I don't find that wallet. And I'm not going to say his name. He, he says he didn't take the wallet. So we're like, okay. And then she said to me, did you pray about it, Mom? I'm like, can you believe this? I forgot. Here I had taught my kids all growing up, if you can't find something, we prayed all the time for things that were missing. We just would look and then we'd just pray and God would just find them for us. And um, I forgot to pray. I never prayed because Grandpa was upset and I was just trying to keep everybody happy and find that wallet. So we prayed. I sat in the garage when I was talking to her. I, was, I think I was out looking in my car. And I just stopped and I prayed. I said, Alex, you're right. I, I never prayed. So um, I prayed. She said she was praying. And then I went in the house. I looked right where Grandpa keeps his wallet right in his dresser drawer where we looked already. Grandpa looked, everybody looked, and guess what? There was a wallet right there. <laughs> so, pray is the key. You always go to God in prayer, and don't forget, because he answers prayers. And two, be careful to assume that other people have done things that maybe they haven't done. Because then we had to call our special grandson and say, we are sorry that we, we thought you took that wallet. And we are very sorry that we thought that because he was being good and he did not do it. Right, Grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. Amen. Amen. Oh, we have to have prayer? Oh, okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for our children and the power of prayer. We thank you that um, we're blessed with the gifts of answers to prayer and uh, the gifts of our grandchildren. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ann Kathy. At this time, we have a scripture reading. So if you get your hardcover Bibles out, 
And we're going to turn to the book of James, which is near the back of the Bible. Near the back of the Bible, we're going to read James 4, 7. And these are good words here. You want to underline these or highlight them? James 4, 7. Hebrews, James, right before the, the Peters and the Johns and the Revelation. James 4, 7. And these are good things to remember. Give you a little more faith here. James 4, 7. You there, Bert? Fine? Okay. And it says, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the read these special words. Ready? Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes, I was that grandpa in the story. Here's the crazy thing. Is I had no idea what story she was going to say or tell, but it addresses two major parts of a sermon, obedience and faith and prayer. There's so much that we could talk about this morning. There's so much that happened in our daily lives. We see our world changing and if we don't stop and drop to our knees over the little things, we'll forget to drop to our knees on the big things. So that being said, let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessings of being here today. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. So many of those things we just take for granted. We just look past them and we believe it's just part of our everyday. But little things like finding my wallet, just the little things, just, it's unbelievable what you do for us. So Lord, with gratitude, we thank you so much for being part of our lives. And we also ask you to help us never to forget that you're there and you love us and have faith in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Man, I tell you, I, the, the, the crazy thing about that story is, is I can't get over this. I looked in that drawer, I can't tell you how many times. You know, about the third hour of looking for something, you're backtracking, you're checking everything out. And I do lay my wallet typically, atypically, on my dresser. It's a tall one, so the grandkids can't get to it. But when they're there for any length of time, I open the drawer up and stick it in there. Well, I know I was there. You do what you want with that. I think we have uh, found in our society today an underlying thought that is just, I don't care whether you're talking to a friend or whether you're talking to a complete stranger or someone at school or work, they're all in complete agreement. We're living in a really angry world right now. Angry. Over everything. Whether it's the way you're driving or the you drive or, or maybe it's political or it's something being taught that we don't want taught to our children. We live in an angry society. Not one of us here today haven't experienced it. It's in our hometowns. I don't care how rural you get. It's there. It's in our schools even in our churches. Have you thought about your own personal life and what happens and how you conduct your business? Where are you more vulnerable to somebody with a crazy idea than right in your own church? Your backs are turned towards the door.
It is amazing what has been happening right here in our country. We know because we've studied where it all comes from, where it stems from. It stems from heaven itself. Lucifer was upset. He just didn't have what he wanted. He felt he was due the same recognition that God himself was. Created perfectly. But did you hear what I just said? Created. There is only one God capable of that who's responsible for each of us sitting here today. Not willing to submit to the fact that he is created. He's lesser than. He continued on. Now his battle, albeit, was pretty political itself. He did a lot of convincing and a lot of uh, marketing his ideas to the point that when he was pushed out of heaven, he took 30% of the inhabitants with him. Oh boy, speaks of tens of thousands. As Christians, we have read from where it all, this unrest comes, right from heaven. Lucifer, not quite happy with his position, so discontent throughout the heaven's gates, promoting a revolt and hoping for acceptance into the Godhead itself. It continued on, though, even after heaven. You know, it wasn't long. Therefore, there was two young men born to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Cain being the first, the oldest. He was a tiller of the grounds. He, he grew things. He was a gardener. He was a farmer. Abel, a herdsman, had sheep. He took care of animals. There was a command after sin regarding sacrifice. He wanted you to do this. He wanted you to take the life of an animal and the blood therefore was a representative of something to come, a shadow. Very specific in nature. But Abel was just like you and I, very proud of what you're doing, very full of what you can provide. And through his abundance, he brought that to the sacrifice. And where it was, probably unbelievably choice growth, vegetables or whatever he brought. It wasn't what he asked for, was it? It was not what God asked for. So through conversation he, the Lord had with him, he was upset. He was mad, very upset. And what did he do? He took it upon himself to remove the person or the example that he was being compared to. I don't know exactly how he killed him, but I would assume he grabbed a club and beat his head in. I don't know. But it happened. He took Abel's life. Rebellion, the same rebellion, and discontent was found in Cain, first born unto Adam and Eve, older brother to Abel, not willing to follow the prescribed sacrificial methods. We see this discontent established in heaven. It took root. Lucifer, now we know as the devil or Satan, was planting this seed in early man. And this seed has taken such root, it continues to grow in man today. One of my favorite things to say is, I want to do it my way. Let me do it. I remember saying that to my father. 
Let me do it. Get out of my way, old man. Let me show you how it's done. But it is the result of this seed that continues to grow in each of our lives that we need to constantly be putting in check. I want to do it my way. It's our cry. Be honest. How many of us have said this, maybe without actually speaking it as well? We just do it. The danger here, folks, is we can talk ourselves right into an unpardonable sin. How, you ask? That seems like a stretch, Rob. But listen, the world is full of your truth and your truth and your truth and your truth today. Haven't you heard that? Well, that's his truth. Did, did, did you know that just recently a guy had a baby? I am not kidding you on MSNBC. A man had a baby. And in reality, it was a female who identified as being a man who become pregnant, who then delivered a child. In her truth, a man had a baby. Come on. If I'm offending anybody at home that's watching this, I apologize, but I don't understand it. That's why I'm talking about it. There's some certain physical truths that I can't jump over. You've heard the expression of jumping the shark? Boy, do they ever. Well, on with this story that I started about the anger and the trouble that we live in today. Let me continue. Throughout time, we have honed our skills. We found the certain minerals out of the ground that we were able to make gunpowder with, and we were able to blow things to smithereens. We could send cannonballs a long way. We could tear ships right out of the sea from these, this action. We develop the, the rifle. We can shoot a man across the yard at the first, the first few times. Now it's snipers can reach several thousand yards. Warfare has changed by this seed of discontent of saying, I want something more. On August 6, 1945, the U.S. 393rd Bombardment, Bombardment Squadron with a specially outfitted Boeing B-29 Super Fortress referred to as the Enola Gay delivered a bomb so lethal and unexpected to our enemies, followed three days later with a similar bomb in, Hirosh or excuse me, in Nagasaki, detonating at about 1,700 feet above the ground surface. It laid flat for the most part, five square miles each. Combined together, over 100,000 people died instantly. And many, many others have died over the years from the fallout effects of radiation. It was a major game changer in our abilities to, for a warfare, but what had changed is the tools that we were going to do f use from then on, because nobody wanted to pull the nuclear pin, even to this day. Nobody wants to do that. Start the world annihilation. So we've developed skills all through the Cold War period like espionage, spying, counterterrorism, sometimes terrorism, all these political isolated incidences 
sometimes to make things happen, sometimes to make things stop. That being said, you're welcome to turn with me to Matthew 24. You probably knew I was going to go there, didn't you? But I'm not going to, I'm not going to the whole, the whole chapter, but Matthew 24, verses eight, uh, 1 through 8, pretty much sums this up. Then Jesus went out of the temple, excuse me, went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Well, you know, they're at that point. Jesus, you see this? Check out this temple. Check out these gates. Check this out. Check that. I mean, I, I build things. I like to do that. And, you know, there's some times where maybe while you're caught up in it, it's just, every day's occurrence, but you go back a year later, you say, that's yeah, pretty cool. You know, I like that. But I'm sure they're there. Look what man has done right here. We've built all this up. And Jesus goes on to explain, surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him separate, or privately, saying, because there was other people around, and they wanted some questions answered. They wanted to know when and how is this all going to happen. But because of the surroundings, they just thought it was probably a more appropriate time. So they waited until he was alone, and they came to him and says, when's this going to happen? And what's going to be the sign? How will we know that this is going to happen? And Jesus said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and I will deceive many. I preached a sermon quite a while back and I've got notes here that I took. Since 1900, so 122 years. At that time, there was more than 1,100 claims of being Christ. Now, we know some of them. We know all the craziness that happens, that are the big headliners, that many lives are taken. We think of David Koresh, Heaven's Gates, Jim Jones. There's just so many that have just, that, that stand out, you know, just pop in your mind. But don't be deceived. That's his, Jesus' words. That's his very first. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive you. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Oh, how much more we got to go through? I mean, don't you get the feeling that you just have seen so much in your adult life that you're wondering how much worse can it be? Can it get? How much longer? It says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and all there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Wow. All of these things are just the beginning of sorrows. So there's your answer. How much longer is it going to go on? We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg, the beginning. I don't know how it's going to manifest itself, and, but it... I know that it will. Just as sure as I found my wallet that day, this is going to happen too. These battles come to us in many different fashions, some right in our own church. Leadership, doctrine, respect, passion, all have fallen to disobedience to God's word and have become diminished traits of the first Christian families. Looking back at our history book, the Bible. I would like to take you to the book 
of James, chapter 4. James chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, starts right out with a question, where do all these wars come from among you? <laughs> what we were just talking about here this morning? But reading in chapter 3, he's talking to the church. What's all the bickering? What's all the problem? What's all this vying for the position? What is this in your church? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure and war in your members? Do you hear what I'm saying? He's speaking to the church of exactly what happened in heaven. The same thing, the same drives, the same appeal to be something that you're not or that you want. You lust and you have, and you do not have. You murder, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Oh, is it that simple? There's another part to that, though, Paula. I mean, I agree with you. There's, it's, you're supposed to ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. What's that saying, folks? Can you, on your knees, pray for something that you hadn't ought to? Or is it saying, when you're on your knees and you're praying for something, ask for it to be in God's will. Are you asking for the right reason? I heard a lady speaking one time on TV. She was a speaker. You may know her, Joyce. Can't think of her last name. Yeah. And she was talking about the blessings of heaven. And she was, you know, you know, we should pray for the Cadillacs and this and that. I've totally taken her comment out of, out of te context, but... That being said, made me wonder, do I pray for my next nickel? Or do I pray for many nickels? You see what I'm saying? Do I pray for a blessing so that I can make the nickel that it takes to feed the family? Or do I pray for many so I can live life on easy street? Where do wars come from? Mostly because we're selfish. We want something we don't have. Do they not come from your desires for your pleasure that war in your members? What are my members? Personally, it's my arms and legs, things I do things with, my members and my soul. Church, speaking of the program, your central theme is your church, and then your outliers are your people taking these messages. Or are they internalizing, not taking the message out, or are they just warring against each other who gets to speak next or who gets the next position? You lust and you do not have, in verse 2. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. It is possible that we pray with bad intentions. 
or a bad attitude. Verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You've got to take a minute. You've got to look at this in Old Testament verbiage. And that is, what did he want out of his relationship with people? Does he not refer to his church as its bride? Run with me on this. If he's asking, yeah, that's right, darling. run with me on this one. If he's not asking you to be his bride, part of a church collectively, Jesus is asking you to be that. Is he not asking you to be his queen? Because is he not king? Is there anything in the kingdom that you know of or have ever read in your life that the queen wasn't in full authority of in relationship to her husband, the king, in his absence? Paints a different picture, doesn't it? Now, what if that queen had a loving relationship with her husband? that goes far beyond just the royalty of it, but I had an intimate relationship where there was two-way going conversation all the time, something bigger. Is there any treasure in the universe that he wouldn't unlock for you? If you don't stop and think about that, he craves for a relationship for each of us, with each of us. He's jealous for it. In first, uh, first, yeah, first John, um, chapter two, verses fifteen through seventeen. I'll just read this to you. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does, does the will of God abides forever. So what we know, what we deal with, what we work with, what we teach with, what we learn from is so important because we do live in the world, don't we? And we work in the world and we have friends in the world. But do we, are we on our guard of just how much we will allow in? In Matthew uh, 6, something very similar, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, Do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. <laughs> oh, I've got a new car, and I've got this, and I've got that, and just uh, the world, the world has set us up to crave those things. It's that status. It's who you are. It's who what, you know, well, how they perceive you. You want to be that person. But it's all going to be torn down. 
Everybody's been there and felt that at some time. I've told you many times about my, my grandma's, my lovely grandma's visit to my second house that I built that we still are in today. And I was so proud of it. And I was, I was proud to show it to her. She was really in an advanced age at this time. But she, on her hands and knees, crawled upstairs to check out the bedrooms. And checked it out, and she, you know, she went through the whole place. And I am beaming from ear to ear. I am very proud. <laughs> and she quotes this verse. <laughs> My feelings were hurt. I didn't understand why she picked such a verse to quote to me. Huh. Do not lay yourselves. Oh, Grandma, really? And then she went on to tell me, not, not one stone will lay upon another. It's all going to be gone. It's all vain. It's all vanity. I didn't get a compliment from her. I didn't. But it's probably the biggest learning moment of my life to what's really important. I can look back now and thank God for that woman. I felt drop kicked through the uprights at that second in time. But she knew exactly what she was saying because she knew exactly where I was. Hey, look at me. Verse 5 goes on to speak. Do you think scripture says in vain? The spirit, I'm, I'm back to James, I'm sorry. I'm back at James, chap, uh, verse 5, chapter 4. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? What's it saying there? Is this a reference to God's jealous yearning for our souls? Or is this a verse saying that our souls you're in jealously for the world. I submit to you can say both because we struggle. It is our struggle, our daily struggle. What's helped me, what's helped me is uh, Paul's writing in Romans chapter 7. I know you've heard this before, but let me just bring it to your, back to your mind. Paul's speaking on his own situation, his own issues, his own problems, which are just exactly like mine. In verse 13, he says, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. Huh. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. Excuse me. For what I do, that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I know that's a little confusing, but he's just, he's in that inner turmoil, he's in that fight like, I know what's right. There's no doubt in my mind what the Lord has told me on how I should act or interact or accept. But every day I pick another route to, to go. For the good that I will to do, I do, I do not do. But the evil I will, not, I will not to do, I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer who did it. 
It's speaking to that. That growing numb to it. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law in my mind. Wow! That kind of explains it, doesn't it? There's a battle going on in each of our souls. Every moment. 24, it says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will, be, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul is a realist. And I think if it weren't for that brother, I probably wouldn't be here today because he helps me put in perspective the relationship that Jesus wants with us. He wants us to recognize that I can't do it on my own. We touched a little bit on that in Sabbath school this morning. I can't do that on my own. I have to have that relationship with him every day. It's got to become part of who I am. I got I to gotta be that guy who's halfway to work and realizing, oh, I forgot to pray with my wife before I left. I forgot to do this. I need to yearn jealously for that relationship. Verse 6, he goes on to say in James, but he gives more grace, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Oh, wow. You say to yourself, kind of change the subject here. What's, what, what's he saying? Why, why do you say that? He gives more grace? Well, that's good. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. But aren't we just talking about each of us having that problem every day? Does he resist us? No, he resists the pride itself, the action. This is each of our battles today, you guys. Living and working in the world and keeping our eyes on the Savior. How then can we overcome James continues on, and he answers it. Verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But submit, that sounds so mamby-pamby. Just give up, just, just submit, just, it sounds weak. That is not a verbiage we like to use in today's society, is it? You don't submit. Submit sounds so weak, but it has been my observation that I cannot resist the devil unless I do. Can't. Because I can't resist him on my own. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So it is about responsibility of having that relationship with the Lord. He's not going to make you drop to your knees. He's not going to make you pray. He's not going to make you do anything. But he's going to put that little fire in your soul that maybe it comes in the fashion of the worst thing you've ever had happen to you. You don't know where else to turn. And then you find yourself turning to the Lord at that time maybe. Or maybe you've been taught as a child to give it over to the Lord. And maybe you've walked from it, but you return back. And then you start to turn it over and over, and you start having this relationship of pouring out your issues. And then all of a sudden, your relationship grows. And you're thanking him every day for the blessings of yesterday. 
And then it continues to grow. And you start asking him, hey, where'd I lose my wallet? But that just comes from that relationship of trust and faith because you've seen him work in your life. The next part of that same verse of draw near, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. So there is a responsibility that when you find that you're there and you're looking fully at the face of God, you see yourself, you're filthy. Spiritually speaking, that is when you see just how bad you really are. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You remember the uh, sanctuary message you know, of Old Testament, what the priests did? prior to the Day of Atonement, the cleansing process they went through, mind, body, and soul. And it was so important when you went in amongst the most of holies that if you weren't ready, you would perish. And other priests would tie a rope around your ankle because in case you weren't ready, they needed to pull you out of there. Purify your hearts, your mind, your soul. Have that relationship with Christ, folks, that you crave it, you want it. It changes your life. And then lament. Mourn and weep. all meaning the same thing. But he mentions it three times. Lament, mourn, and weep. That's how important it is. When he mentions something three times, it means recognize where you're at. Get on your knees and pour your heart out to him. Let him know that you recognize the fact that you're dirty, that you are that sinner, that you need help. You can't do this on your own. And then, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. That is the point where you recognize, I can't do anything by myself. How many hundreds of things do you take for granted every day or every week or every month that you just, you know, oh well, this turned out pretty good and that turned out pretty good and this turned out pretty good and, you know, I had success doing that. You need to develop that relationship that you realize where that's coming from. In a summary of this last part of James, I put it like this. The only way that I can submit to God is if I draw nearer. As I draw near, I see my filth, both physically and within my heart. As I recognize this condition, I naturally want to be cleansed, to be more presentable to my God. It is at that time that I really search my soul and I weep over the mess that I've made. Then with a humble, contrite heart, I recognize that I control nothing, nothing by myself. It is only through this influence of Jesus in my life that I can influence others to establish a long-awaited relationship that he so jealously yearns for. Not only the relationship that you have with the Lord, he wants you to teach it and be an example to others so that naturally they can get a glimpse of something that they don't have. And when you see something so beautiful, you want it. 
a relationship with God. I'll leave you with this thought. It was, it was a statement that Helen Keller made. The best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or touched. They must be felt in the heart. Isn't that the truth? I love you guys. But I'll tell you what. We really need to take it to the Lord our, every day. We need to take our lives, the lives of our children, the lives of our grandchildren to the Lord. We need to prop each other up. We see a, a leader or a, a fellow member stepping outside the prescribed method of our doctrine. We don't condemn them. We put our arms around them and we lift them up. Don't bash their heads in with it. Show them how much Jesus loves them. And explain that yearn that he has for them and that relationship. That will turn them faster than a club upside the head. I pray that each of us can find that that relationship where we lead out in faith because we've seen him work so many times and do such amazing things in our life that when somebody comes up to you at an airport and say, hey, brother, are you saved? You don't look like a deer in a headlight. You say, yes, sir. Because your relationship's that strong. It takes a while for all of us to get there. But have that relationship. And you can move mountains through the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you give us, all the lessons, all the studies that you've provided for us in the Bible. So much happened so long ago that is so prudent to the time we live in and so closely parallels to what we're going through now. Lord, this is not a new game in your sight. But to us, we've only scratched the surface and I think we're only beginning to see what's going to happen. I don't know, Lord, if this is your last generation of this church sitting here today. I pray that we can all take part in a relationship with you that changes us forever and changes those of us around us. I pray for your strength. I pray for your, your love for us. Build our faith, Lord. Help us to be that person that Christian that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Molly, coming up. Our closing song is How Great Thou Art, hymn 86.
Dear Father, Lord, as we depart from here today, we ask that you travel with us back to our homes, back to our work week next week, or school, or whatever it is that we do. First, help us to establish that relationship with you that we can carry over and take with as we travel about. And the stronger that relationship gets, the more we pour you into our vessels. And then when we get out there in the world, the more of you we have to pour out on them. That is my prayer in Jesus' name.